made for mission. This is our fifth week to share with you along that thought, made for mission. And we're going to look in just a moment into John chapter 13. So if you have your Bible, I hope you'll open up and look there. We looked at that a few weeks back and we established it was we're all called. We're called. If we're saved, we're called. We're called to be on mission with God. And what we're trying to grasp and understand here, there's something more to us than just going to church on Sunday, more than just uh, being a good neighbor, more than just teaching a class, more than just serving God in some capacity, in some component of our life. That our life is to be a mission, that we have a calling, that we have a purpose, that we have something to be a part of that's greater than we are. We're not just about uh, making money and buying more houses and more cars and having more stuff and, and all that. We're about being on a mission for God. Jesus demonstrates that for us. He teaches us that. He shows us that. And then he's called those disciples and they've been walking with him for three, three and a half years. When John 13 begins to unfold, that's where he is. He is seated with them and he begins to reveal to them some very powerful truth. Now this is interesting because I've pretty much lived in John 13 for the last week or so and tried to just absorb all of that I can into my being. Now I know we've heard this scripture before. You probably know it and understand it, but I want you to ask God to reveal something new to you today that maybe you haven't heard before. Maybe you haven't realized before. You haven't grasped before on this concept and on this thought process here of being on a mission. Now, the coolest thing is uh, Leonardo da Vinci was going to do the painting of the Lord's Supper. Y'all know the painting, most famous. It is considered a masterpiece of all masterpieces. His inspiration for that was John chapter 13. He read John 13 and he, he, I believe God placed it in his mind to do that painting that we've all known, seen, and it's been reproduced over and over and over. It took him three and a half years to draw that picture. He spent three and a half years on one picture. And at times it was said that he would stop painting and he would sit there and look at that picture for three or four hours at a time. And he was doing this in a monastery and the monks would come by and say, what are you doing? What, are you never going to finish? And, and he would make this statement. He'd say, the longer it takes to make a brushstroke, the more powerful that brushstroke is. We live in an instant society. We want everything now. Boom, now. Everything's instantaneous for us now. And sometimes, I'm going to tell you what, God wants to make a masterpiece. Sometimes it takes a little while. Sometimes it takes a little bit for us to have to season out, to move into that place. Because God wants to create within us, I believe this, a masterpiece. John 13 is a masterpiece. It is a masterpiece of what God has to say to us. And the more I looked at it, the more overwhelmed I came by trying to bring some thought together to help us today to think of this place of mission. We say, why mission? Why mission? Because we saw the video, 99 sheep, one was missing. He went for the one. And Jesus was speaking that of himself. In that same chapter in Luke, there, there's a lady who has a coin. And one's missing. And she sweeps the house till she finds the one. And then there's great rejoicing. And then there's that great story of the prodigal son. And we know it. And, and, and the story's about the love of a father for the son who's gone astray. And all of those, something's missing. Something's brought back together. Here's what I want to tell you something. If we've been saved, we have a mission. We have a mission to see people's soul saved from hell. Amen. That's more than just going to church on Sunday. That's more than just teaching a class. That's more than just living life. There is a purpose. There is a mission. There is something that we're to be about. And we've tried to grasp that in the last days about how we're called in that and how we're distracted from that and how Jesus went even to the least of those. And then Derek talked to you last week how, how Jesus went in on the day of the resurrection and met with those men on the road to Emmaus and, and he was dealing with them to help them to be able to know and experience something. Because here's what I want you to know. God has called us on mission God has called us to have purpose, to live our lives for something greater than just ourselves. That's powerful to me. That's meaningful to me. Boy, Jesus begins to unfold that here in John 13. I just want to read all 17 verses together. 
Listen, absorb that in. And then we're going to kind of look at a few pieces and a few components of that together. And you'll be able to see kind of what we're trying to say and understand today about this place of mission. But now, John 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come and that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord... Do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand it hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Then Lord, wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you then know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Father, we thank you for this moment that you've given us to be together today. For each and every person in this place, God, as we've come and worship. We thank you that we can read this masterpiece of scripture. God, this words of Jesus and the disciples in that room Lord, I pray that right now all of our minds, all of our hearts, all of our attentions will be drawn to these verses in the next few minutes. And Lord, I pray, I pray, Lord, that you just open my heart, our hearts to your word, to your truth. I pray that it will penetrate within us. Lord, I pray that it will move in our hearts, stir our minds, and Lord, be powerful in our emotions today. And I pray, God, that we as Solitude Baptist Church will understand this place of mission and that we as individuals in this room today will understand this place of mission. That we're to be about something more than just about ourselves. So thank you. Bless your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First thing I want you to grasp in this. Why mission? Why mission? Why mission? Why worry about it? Why to go to all the trouble that we would go to? And here's the thing. That first little fill in the blank. You'll see that. Because of this. People matter to God. I want you to grasp that. People matter to God. Now, I want you to see that. We're going to talk about that just a minute in a couple of different ways. But when we look at this verse, the first one, after the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that the hour had come, that he would depart out of the world, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I want you to grasp that. He loved them to the end. Now, we think about that. We think the end means the, the conclusion of. We think he loved them till he died. He loved them to the end. Here's what that means. It means he loved them to the depth that something can go. It means, it, the word really means eternally. It means he loved them with something that is just beyond here and now. It's something that is of eternal. He loved those disciples. Not only did he love those disciples, but he had other people that he knew that he loved. And I kind of listed them out there, I think, for you to try to just think about that. The people in you, the disciples, one. Lazarus, Mary, Martha, just a few chapters back in, in John 11, we know the story of, of Jesus and Lazarus. And we know this. We know how he loved those people that he knew. He loved them to the end because of this. And here's what I want you to grasp. When you get, people matter to God. That's important. People's more important than this building. People's more important than the seat we sit on or the lights we look at or, or the microphones we might deal with and, and everything that goes with that and all the struggles it can have sometimes in the things of the world. Jesus knows, wants us to know this. We are what is important to him. He wants us to grasp that, to realize that and know that. 
Not only the people that he knew, but I want you to think about people mattered to him that he didn't even know. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, we know a few weeks back we talked about how he went across the Sea of Galilee and he met up with a man in a cemetery whose name was Legion. We talked about that, the, the maniac who was filled with demons. You know what? That man mattered to Jesus. Amen. That person mattered to God. Uh, also along in this journey, he, he's met a woman at a whale, a woman he didn't know. But that woman mattered to him. Now, here's what I want you to grasp. If you're here this morning, kind of like Lee said earlier, and you feel away from God, here's what you can know this morning. You matter to God. God cares about you. Where you are, what you face, what you go through, what you're good at, what you're bad at, where you're nice and where you're ugly. He loves you. He cares about you. He wants you to know that, to grasp that, and to realize that. Because here's what's going to happen. What we know about this place of God's love for us and how we matter to Him has everything to do about how I live my life on mission or not. It's important. We don't grasp that. When we can realize this place of how we matter so to God, that's going to make a difference. Because here's the reverse flip of that for me. When I realize that, here's what happens to me. When I look at people, here's what I say. They matter to God. Every person I see, I go, wow. You know what? Glenn Thank you matters to God. He matters to God just as much as I do. You know, we need to look at that and grasp that. Because we look at the world and we just see sometimes all this sea of people. And we lose the fact that not only do people matter to him. That when I am involved in mission. When my life is about purpose. And I'm about something greater than myself. And I look at other people and I see them. I realize something that, you know what? People matter to me. And when people matters to you, that's going to change the whole dynamic of how you live your life. Well, naturally, when I was gone, I went to the bookstore. And that's just a thing sometimes I tend to do. And I've, if the greatest weakness I have is the bookstore. Because I go in the bookstore and it's just like, <gasps> so anyway, I only bought two books. But one of the books was so powerful. It's written uh, by a guy named Stoll who used to be at Willow Creek Church. And, and the book really is about uh, teaching kids, about how to teach kids things. And the, and the coolest thing, I have studied this text. I have studied this. I have had this on my mind. And I opened up the book and one of the chapters is this. It said, teach your children that they matter to God. And I went, how cool is that? Not only that, but teach them that other people matter just as well. And in there, there's a story. And I want to share that story with you briefly because I want you to grasp what he says about it because it has to do with how I view people and my place of mission. He told the story about coaching about an 11 and 12 year old basketball team. And he said he's coaching this basketball team and, and as they start out the season, you know, they're so-so and the, the rules is every person gets to play. Every kid gets to play. One little boy on his team, you know, how every team's got one, his name's Ben. Ben's just not very good at all. But every time his mama's got him there at practice on time, and then every time his mama's got him for the game on time, but she drops him off and she leaves. So Ben does practice by himself. Ben does the games by himself. He goes in and plays. And, and, and Stoll said, here's what he said to him. He said, now Ben, when you get in there, all right, when we got the ball, just kind of just hang loose a minute because, you know, don't, don't get too much in the way. And when the other team's got the ball, you just get between the guy, your garden, and the goal. And just get in his way. Well, the whole year went through and the little fella just couldn't get it. He just was not very good at all. Just didn't work for him. And then all of a sudden, there are five wins, four losses. It's the last game of the season. And if they can win this game, they'll have a winning season. And you know the coaches, that's a big deal. So he said to me, that's just a big deal. So here comes Ben in with his mama and a little boy. His name was John. And he said he brings his mama and John up to the coach and says, Coach, my mama's here today and, and she's brought John, my best friend from where I used to live. He's staying with me. He's going to come to the game. And he said, my first thought was, oh, I hate for what they're going to see. I hate for how this is going to come across. But he said, that's awesome, Ben. And he said, I want you to get in there. And it's important today. You give us your best. You go give us your best. So we didn't play him the first half. He puts him in in the third quarter and said, all of a sudden, they're, they're moving around. And they throw the ball to Ben on offense. And he's standing wide open. And he shoots. And he makes it. 
And he said he went nuts. That's the first shot the kids made all year. The first shot he's attempted all year. He said he was so excited to coach calls timeout, puddles the team together, and just brings elation upon this kid. Like, that's awesome, Ben. That is awesome. So the bottom line of the whole story is this. Ben scores 12 points, and they win the game. And at the end of the game, he calls them together, and he looks at Ben and says, What in the world got into you today? What happened to you today? Now, I've written this down because I want to say it right. He said, Coach, my mama and my best friend was here. And he went, oh. He said, they matter to me. And I matter to them. So today, I gave my best. And here's what Stoll said. For the first time this season, people cared enough to watch me. And I believed I mattered to someone so I played with confidence and I believed in myself. Because I matter to God. Because you matter to God. You and I should live our life in such a way that we're on a mission that we want to give our best to our lives so that other people can know what it means to come to know Jesus. I tell you what I believe. I believe so often we shy away we slick back and we're not always concerned and connected where people are. Because more often than not, a lot of people believe this. You know what? I don't really matter. I'm just a guy. I'm just a girl. I'm just a nobody. I don't have a lot to offer. Listen, let me tell you something. You have a lot to offer because Jesus loved you enough to die in your place on the cross. And he has saved you and put you in a place that he wants your life to count for something greater than probably you even know. Amen. Powerful words to me about mission. Know this. People matter to God. I cannot leave that verse though without knowing this. Because every time I've read through this and studied this, there's something, it's like almost God keeps poking me in the ribs when he says this, when he said, Jesus knowing that his hour had come. Jesus knowing that his hour had come. Under that part right there, if you're keeping notes, write one word, urgency. Urgency. Of all the times Jesus has done anything, back in John 2 when he turned water to wine, he kept saying this, but my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. My time has not yet come. Tonight, in John chapter 13, he realized this and he communicated this. The hour has come. I believe in my mind when he's speaking to them in that night, there's a little bit more urgency in his voice. There's a little bit more sense of power in what he has to say to them. Because he's nearing the end. And him nearing that end, what he says to them is ever more powerful than what it could have been otherwise. And I want to tell you something. For us, we need to realize for our lives, every one of us in this room, we ought to live it with some kind of sense of urgency. We need to grasp that because especially, I know this, when we're young, we just think, oh, we got all these years ahead. And then we go through life and all of a sudden we go and we keep thinking we got, we got time, we got time, we got time. I want to tell you something. Somebody in this room today needs to hear this. God is saying to you, you need to have a sense of urgency. The time has about come. Now, I don't know. We look at prophetic calendar and we think the time's about come that Jesus will come back again. And I believe that. And I believe that could be any moment, any time of any one of our days. But I know this. There's people in this room today whom God has been calling. God has been speaking to. God has been trying to summons and call to himself. And here's what you need to know. He's saying the hour has come. The time has come. You need to be aware of that and be mindful. Of that. And if that's for you, I hope you, you hear that. And I hope you open and receive your heart to that this morning. Because to me personally, that's a powerful word. I remember for me when the hour had come. And I still grasp that even today. Powerful thoughts. The other part of this is this. Number two here. Think about this. The foundation of Jesus' mission. The foundation of Jesus' mission flowed from his identity. There's a word, identity. Here's what I want you to grasp. Back in verse 1. Knowing his hour had come, that he would depart from the world. Then in verse 3. Knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. And that he would come forth from God and was going back to God. Then in verse 11 it says, knowing that one would betray him. And he uses that term quite through there. Knowing, 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 knowing. He knew something powerful in that moment. 
I'm going to tell you something. And here's what he knew. And if you look at those places there, we can grasp this feeling. But he knew who he was. He knew who he was. He was the son of God. And his mission was clear. He knew whose he was. He knew he belonged to the father. He understood that. And he understood his identity was the son of God. He grasped that. He realized that. He lived in that. He owned that. Do you grasp? Then it says he knew what he was here for. He knew that that time had come. He realized what he was here for. He knew where he was going. It said he'd been from God and he was going back to God. He knew where he was going and he knew where the power came from. He knew the Father had put all things into his hands. He knew the authority. I'm going to tell you what. Jesus walked in the identity of who he was in that moment. And I'm going to tell you what. To do with mission, if I do not understand my identity as a Christian, as a child of God, as somebody who is saved and born again and forgiven, and if I'm trying to gain my identity from the world, by what I do, where I live, what I make, what I drive, how many kids I've got, what they're involved in. If I'm trying to gain identity anywhere other than it is founded in who I am as a child of God, I will never be truly plugged into mission. I will never truly know mission. I will miss God's mission for my life because I am not plugged in. Something's plugged in. I don't know what that is, but it's weird. <laughs> Jesus understood his identity. I want you to think this. If somebody asks you, who are you? Who are, describe yourself. How do you identify yourself? That's an interesting thought, isn't it? How do I identify who I am? Who am I? How do I come across that? I'll tell you how I was for years. I was just Zach's dad. I was, that's how I identified myself. I'm Zach's dad. You know, then, then Cassie comes along. Then you're Cassie's dad. And we find, and now for the most part, I'm, I'm identified as, as the pastor. The pastor. Everybody know pastor. You're identified as pastor. I'm going to tell you what, how I need to be realized and identified is I am Joey, a blood-bought saint of the living God, whose life is secure absolutely by the power of God, who has a place, a plan, and a mission on this earth. And when I leave here, I'm going to an eternal home where I'll live forever and ever with God. That needs to be my identity. Because when I get my identity right, then I can get my mission right. And when my identity is messed up, my mission will always be missing. That's a powerful thing for us to be able to try to grasp and understand. So I want you to try to grasp that and, and hold on to that and to realize that where is that identity for you? What is that that you're holding on to? What is it that you're grasping in that? Here's the last part of this. We'll get through this right in time for them, that to stop. Okay? Here's the last part. Here's what I want to say. Made for missions. Made for missions equals a life in relationship with God. A life in relationship with God. And here's what I want you to try to grasp. And there's something I want you to understand about this that is powerful. And then, then hear what God says. He pours water into a basin and he's going to wash their feet. And as he begins to wash their feet, Peter, who is prideful. Now, I want you to understand. They've just had a conversation. Which one of us is going to be the greatest? <laughs> Which one? One of us is going to sit at the right hand of the throne. Which one of us is going to be the man in glory? Which one of us is going to be that? And all of a sudden, Jesus, whom they see as the man of that moment, gets a towel and is going to do the most menial task that could be done on the face of the earth in that day. And that's to wash dirty feet. He's going to go and begin to wash dirty feet. And in that, all of a sudden, Peter goes, no, Lord. And he says, unless you allow me to wash your feet, you have no part of me. Other oh, than Peter replies, then wash me all over. And, and here's what I want you to get. And here's just a principle. Here's something I want you to grasp that comes out of this for me. A life in this relationship with God. A life lived in this. And you see those terms. Pour out. To pour in. To pour out. I want you to think about that with me. A mission. Pour out. That can pour in. That you can pour out. All of us. Even when we are saved. Walks around sometimes. And if you can picture this. I was going to draw this. I was, I was going to draw this illustration for you. But I, I couldn't get it. Okay. A glass of dirty water. Imagine a glass of dirty water. 
and just look at that glass. And all of us, even saved, we still walk around in this earth, as they did, and their feet got dirty. And sometimes we get dirty. Sometimes we get stinky attitudes instead of stinky feet. We, we get bad attitudes. We get selfish people. We can be, I'm going to tell you what, Christians can be some of the most doggone selfish people I have ever seen in my life. And we can be selfish. And, and yes, we're saved, but we're kind of we're kind of like dirty water. For this to work, you're going to have to pour the dirty water out. You're going to have to pour that out to God. You're going to have to come to God as Jesus is going to do even later and say, Lord, he pours himself out to God that God in turn can pour some clean water in. And when he cleanses you, all of a sudden when that clean comes in, you've got something that is of value to people. You've got something that is of value to be helpful to people. Something that can be meaningful to people. You have some refreshment that you can give someone. Because I'm going to tell you what. Nobody wants a glass of stinky water. Nobody wants a glass of dirty. Well, you don't even want to be around it. You don't want to look at it. You don't want to see it. And there's people who are Christians I don't want to be around. I don't want to look at. I don't want to listen to. Because there's stinky water. We need to pour that out. And we need to fill that up with the Spirit of God. And when that Spirit of God comes in, we've got something that is worth offering other people. To me, Jesus is saying to them, hey, listen, you've got convoluted in the world here. I want you to understand this place. Pour yourself out. Let me clean you up so that you've got something to offer in the world in which you live. Because here's the thing. You guys are it. Y'all are it. Right. <laughs> the fate of the church hung with those 12 men. 11, really. The salvation of souls hung with those 11 men. Amen. They were the mission. Today, we are the mission. And we need to understand there's things we need to pour out so that God can pour in that we in turn can pour out. Now, I'm just going to tell you this story. I didn't mean to. But when we come back, I was off. It was good. It was good. I was able to relax and you know, so I come back on Tuesday morning and then I was actually going to go over to see Barry Kenny at the hospital. And a few things in my world uh, interrupted along the way. And as I'm driving over there, I just got filled with dirty water. I was just, man, it's early in the morning. I've been off for five days and all of a sudden I'm worse off than where I left. You know, and I'm thinking, I need to go in that room and, and have something of value to offer. And in this moment, I don't have anything. But frustration, aggravation. Mm. Does, does anybody else ever do that? <laughs> and so as I'm driving, I just, I just tried to say a prayer. Tried to unload some of that so that I could go in that room. And, and I did go in that room. And I'm going to tell you what, this shared the grace of God. And prayed and loved and expressed love. And I walked out of there a totally different person. Because sometimes I get all this in me and I have to pour it out so that God can pour in so that I've got something of value to be able to give to people. That which is of value is God, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. I read this little story and I just got to share it with you and then we will pray. A short story about a self-centered old man who dreams that he died and he went to hell. In the midst of his anguish, he looks upward and cries out for a second chance. A voice from heaven asks him, What have you done to merit a second chance? After much soul searching, the man remembered. Oh, once I was walking in the woods and I saw a spider and I didn't kill it. Hmm. At that very moment, a thin silvery thread of a spider web was lowered down into hell. He reached up and took hold of it. In the midst of his anguish and his misery, that thread began to lift him up. And he begins to rise up and he's sensing he's coming out of that. At the same time, two men on each side of him sees that. 
And they reach over and grab hold of his pants leg. And all of a sudden, they begin to rise up with him. And as they're rising up, and he looks around, and here's what he says to both of them. Let go! Let go now! At that moment, the thread broke. And all three of them dropped back into that misery of hell. Interesting story. It said the man knew that that thread had enough to lift three men out of that pit of anguish. But that thread didn't have enough to lift one selfish soul. Hmm, that's interesting. Here's my theory. We live so much eat up with ourselves and our thread and wanting what we want. We miss God's mission. God's mission for me, God's mission for you is to lead some soul to know eternity, to miss hell and to go to heaven, to know what it means to be saved, to know what it means not to be lost. We all have that mission. We all have that calling. We all have that purpose. And I'm going to tell you what. You need to know you matter to God. The people around you matter to God. Your identity needs to be wrapped up in who you are in Christ. And you need to understand you got some stuff that you need to let go of. So that he can fill you up with something that is of value to someone. That you can be a part of helping change a life. That's our mission. That's why it matters. Let's pray.